make a pretty good mobile web browser using WebKit. We have Android, we have iPhone, we have the, the browser with Blackberry Torch, and we just see more and more. It's also less bootstrapping because a lot of pieces needed to make a good mobile browser is already in place. So, we type a totally different uh, form factor than a desktop browser. On a mobile device, the screen is usually quite small, which makes for a lot of different problems. And we also, we're also not using a keyboard and we're not using a mouse to navigate. So we have a totally different input. You might say to yourself, well, Nokia hasn't been really good at doing web browsers. Uh, the track record isn't really that good. Well, you can say that today, that might be true, but actually Nokia was the first company that brought a WebKit to a mobile, browser, uh, to a mobile platform. And they did that many years ago. And they actually did pretty well. But there's a lot of things that has changed since then. For instance, today, it's, there's Wi-Fi everywhere. There's access to 3G. The cost plans are a lot cheaper than they used to be. If, before, people weren't really using an internet browser on a mobile phone because it was really slow. It was really expensive, and it couldn't really render the real web pages, so we had to get these walk pages with like limited content, and it wasn't really what people wanted. So all of these things has changed. Today we have nice data plans, we have larger mobile screens, we have a different way of interacting with the content using touch using your fingers, and we have more powerful devices. So this means that. Today it's possible to actually bring the real internet to mobile devices. You have more screen real estate and you have powerful, more powerful processes. So you can actually load these real pages and process them and show the content to the user. But there's a lot of challenges in making a mobile web browser. First of all, as I mentioned, we have a small form factor. Things just doesn't fit on the screen. You can't really see a whole page. Then you might have to to make it smaller, and then the text is so small that you can't really read it. So there's a lot of different issues. Another problem is that loading the page from the net, where we're having a slower net connection, we also have to understand and pass this on a slower processor. Then we have to go through the layout page to figure out where should the text be? Should it be reflowing? Should it be a box here? We have to do all this before we can paint. And then we have to paint. So that's very slow in comparison with a desktop browser, where we have maybe a form of computer. Then there's something also very, very important. Touch interaction requires a very, very responsive user experience. I'll get into that a bit later. Also, fingers are pretty huge. So you're trying to click a small link with a big finger, and you can't even see where you're clicking. So, because content is small, it's so normally so you normally zoom out, uh, so you can't see it. So we'll talk about that as well. There's also the web apps. People are trying to make web apps today, like email, clients, etc. So that brings a whole lot of different challenges. But we'll talk about that at the end of this presentation. So let's look at the small font. There are already some really, really great ideas how to deal with it. The first is zooming. It needs to be possible to zoom out, or zoom in to look at what is interesting for you. Some good ideas, for instance, you can do like double tap to some specific area of the page. For instance, if you have different columns on a news page, like New York Times, double tap on one area and you will zoom in. I think I can have an example of that here. At New York Times, a double tap on an article, and it automatically zooms in so you can read it. This is not perfect. And there are, there are areas where the page where you can't find these nice areas to zoom into. So you also want it to be able to do that ma manually. So people can like do pin zoom with two fingers. I want to see this area. Maybe even move the page around with the same time. Pin zoom, I don't know if you can see this two dots, like the two fingers. I try to pin out. So I can see the whole page. So we'll probably just go back and you can pin in so you can look at more buttons. But there's still a lot of issues. Even though we saw that I zoomed in here, it might be that the text, or that that column is, is pretty pretty wide, so the text becomes so small that it's impossible to actually read. There are different solutions for, for fixing this. 
and draw a contour zone for the vortex reflowing. I have an image of this, the same article. I don't know this pretty dark. It, it means that when you zoom into something, you don't want it. You have the whole text here. And now in order to be able to see it, you have to zoom into this area. So you have to read here, scroll to the side, read the next, scroll back, start the next one. And that's pretty annoying. So Android, they fix that by reflowing the text. So it means that when you make a specific zoom level, you just relay out the text. So everything fits into one view. This is something that's really, really hard to, to get right. I don't know if people have tried Android, sometimes it just doesn't work. And you end up with text that's always outside the, the view. You try to move it a bit, it's still outside the view because it does the reflowing again. Something else is that I said before, doing the layout is pretty expensive. So it can interrupt the whole user experience. And there's a third issue is that when you zoom in, you get this nice animation, everything zooms in, and then everything just changes position. So maybe even what you wanted to see is now outside the, outside the screen. So GI phone has a different solution for the same problem. It's known from desktop browsers that, that you can have a setting like minimum font size, you say enforce this minimum font size, never show font smaller than this. GI phone brought that a bit further. They said the minimum font size is per width. So when you can double tap some area, they enforce the minimum uh, font size when you zoom into the area. <coughs> so, if I zoom into this area again, they will say, well, the font size of this area has to be 10 or 20 or 12. This means that the original page, you would like to see that maybe the font size in, in the first column is like this one, and then in the middle column, it, because they have a better uh, wider width when zoomed in, the font size might even be bigger. I bet no, none of you have noticed that on the iPhone. You don't really see it. If you know it's there, you can go to the New York Times this page and you'll see that sometimes in some columns, the wider the columns are, they often have increased the font size a little bit. It doesn't annoy people. It just makes sure that you always get a nice animation and it's always possible to read the text and it's so big. But there's a lot of different ideas and there's probably new ideas that can be explored as well to solve these issues. So, let's get back to the fingers. As I said before, our fingers are pretty big. So it's really, really difficult. On a computer, you're having a mouse that has one dot. You click on one specific point. On a finger, it's, it's, it has like a surface you're clicking on. And many, many times, you, people are even shaking. It's really, really common. Like, I think everyone shakes a little bit when you try to click on something. There's a little friction there. And we move the page a bit. So, we need solutions for, for dealing with these things. Like I said before, like on one of these pages, that one of the problems we have in this conference is that you in, you're looking at some little area and want to go to the next area. You need to be able to pad around the page pretty fast. <coughs> On a desktop browser, you normally have a big screen so you see everything, and first a little later you, you start scrolling a bit. But on a mobile page, you often zoom in to some specific area, and you want to be able to get an overview and get back soon. So the double tap is pretty good for zooming into a specific area. And you can do the same way that if you double tap the same area, that it will zoom out so you get the overview. <coughs> Still, it doesn't solve everything, and there are pages that don't even have like zoomable areas maybe just text. So we wanted to be able also to pan around fast. So we make it possible to like you can pan around with your finger, like you on Android or the iPhone, but still also if you pan like a, a, a bigger area with a little force it will start doing some kinetic scrolling and making it scroll faster. So you can easily get to the content you want to see. Also as the screen state is pretty small, we don't want to have scroll bars. It's not nice, clean scroll, you want to pad, it feels more natural, and it also takes up space on your screen. So most mobile browsers, they don't show scroll bars. Instead, they use what they call scroll indicators. Things that show themselves when you're padding or pinching, and then disappear when you don't need them. Because when you're padding, for instance, anyway, you're padding pretty quickly and you're not reading anything. So it's pretty good. You can 
just look at the sides of the scroll bar and you can see if you're at the top or at the bottom. You can also make other ways to show that you reach the boundary, like the bottom of the video link. For instance, by doing a bounce screen or make your cell phone shake a little bit. There are different ways of doing that. As I said before, fingers often shake a little bit, also when you click. So it's always a good idea to have some thresholds. Like when you click before starting panning, you say, okay, you have to move like 10 pixels before you start pinching. You have to move 10 pixels just to ignore all these, these small uh, imprecise, uh, imprecise movements that people make. So this is very common, and you notice that if you take an iPhone or an Android, this is implemented this way. If you start pinching, you can pinch like maybe 5, 10 pixels before it starts pinching. And the same thing with moving. Which means that if you click on a bottom, it doesn't start moving the page or do connect scrolling, which would be really annoying. Another way is that if I'm trying to pan, I'm zoomed into a page. Like this one, I start to pan. It's very, very difficult to do like a movement straight up. You always move it a little bit to the right or to the left. So you can try to guess or look at the various you find, okay, the guys probably wanted to pan up uh, upwards, and then you just ignore it, unlock it in that direction. So you don't, if you're reading an article, you will suddenly scroll out of it and have, have trouble scrolling back again. So there are all these different small tricks you have to apply to use trust as input. Something else is that I said before is that our fingers, when you click on the device, you have a touch area. So, you need to find out like a point where you clicked. Normally, this would be the touch area you get from the touch point. And normally, you can do that by user test, you find out that people actually want to click a bit above that area, like where I put the dot here. So you can take that as a starting point. But instead of just looking at what's below it, because most of the time you might miss it, because you have big fingers, they're unprecise, and you can't see where you click. So we need some algorithm in WebKit that will try to figure out whether anything clickable in this area where I clicked. So was that link just below it? So the, the user probably wants to click on that link, and then we will click on that for the user. Another big issue with having scrollable content and using your fingers and scrolling is that we want it to be like one area that you're scrolling. It really confuses people. If you're scrolling, but suddenly you hit some area, sub area in the scroll, that will really confuse people because suddenly you start scrolling differently. That could be like a page that has frame sets or a page that has like iframes that are scrollable. So, for instance, what the iPhone does is it says, there are no, there are no, uh, scroll for iframes. So they simply expand the iframes to their size, to the size of their contents. You would think that was something that would break a lot of pages, but in practice it doesn't. They do the same thing for frames as we will also do. For instance, this is a test, one of the WebKit tests. It shows the frame set, it's a bit strange. But you see that if you had this on, on a small phone, that would be really difficult to read the text. Here you have to pan a little small area, here you have to pan this area. You just want everything to be like one big area that you can pan. So the idea is that we expand all the sub frames to their uh, contents area. And then sometimes you get some area that are not occupies and you expand these other frames a bit further. So you get something like this. So this would frame set, frame flooding enabled. So you get one big area that's scrollable. So, the conclusion is that touch is a really, really nice way to interact with web content. It feels very natural, it feels easy. But there is one huge issue. <coughs> if you really feel it if the page is blocked. Like I said before, if you have a desktop browser, you open it up, you have a big desktop browser, you load a page, there's the contents, you almost see everything you want to see, and then you start scrolling. So now you start scrolling when it's already finished loading. Or even if it blocks a bit, you don't really notice it. But on a mobile device that's slower, where you're using your fingers, you really feel when things fall. And
and browsers they store a lot. They do that during loading. The most common idea is to separate the UI and the web in different, either different threads or different processes. One way to do it is that you have like a web, let's just talk about the UI process and the web process. So you have like a web process, it will paint something, it might store the painting sequence, send it to the UI process, you can then repaint it. This is from what I know is what they're doing on Android. Or you can like share the painting area, like it paints into some shared memory of the web process when you're ready, you can show it on the UI process. What is really important is that everything is non blocking So we need to design a whole new API that makes sure that we can do almost everything non blocking Because if something blocks, everything blocks and you view it. There's one example I've written down here. Think about it, a page has like fixed elements. Should it be a fixed element, it has to always be at the bottom. It, as is the web engine that's painting it, every time you scroll, you have to tell the web engine I scrolled, and you have to tell it back for each pixel. Okay, this, it has to paint and to re-update. But if we did it this way, it would be, in, it would be blocking the whole time. So it's, we have to find solutions for all these small corner cases, and I'll tell you, there are a lot. Sometimes it's not the perfect solution, it breaks contents, like the iPhone doesn't support uh, fixed elements, for instance. I, I believe there are very few mobile browsers that support that. I have some good ideas how we can support at least 90% of uh, fixed elements, but there are all these different issues which we have to solve. And it's really important we do this while people are panning, pinching, or while we do rotating. Our solution of, this is a solution similar to what they're doing on the Blackberry and what they're doing on, on the iPhone. It's using a, a synchronous tiling. It means that we look at the whole concept as one big image. Like we paint the whole concept into an image. Then you can pan an image, you can scale, like pinch, zoom an image, and you can rotate it uh, at 60 frames per second. It's like a magical number. So, here's an example. The green part, that is our screen, is what we're currently looking at. And the gray, the gray and the blue area is like the content. So the content is divided into different tiles. Some of these tiles I have called edge tile because I've changed the size a bit, because I want to be able to still maybe pan out and maybe pan back. You know, I want it all to be shown. But this is the basic idea. So, when the tile becomes visible, when you're scrolling, if it's already painted by the web process, which we're doing with shared memory or memory map I.O., well, then we can just split it. Just paint that tile on the screen. If it's not available, we can do some indication that the content is not ready yet. For instance, by painting checkerboards, which is something that's known for most of the images at the case like Photoshop or even the iPhone is using. Like so like the content is not ready yet, we need a short bit. This means that we have decoupled the whole web engine from the UI. The UI just paints tiles, images, that sometimes get updated by the web process. Of course pages they change, their animation, their calendars. So 
when a page changes, like when one of the tiles is visible, we of course have to update it. We don't have to repaint the whole tile, but we can just paint like the area. So we have to make sure that we paint the area for all tiles visible, uh, so that all tiles stay in sync. We can't have like, for instance, a tile that's outside the view that wasn't updated, and one that's inside the view that got updated, because then you might see that when the tiles they, they interact, that here it's painted and here it's not painted. Like if you have to have a blue box, then you see the blue box here, but the blue box isn't appear here. So all the tiles have to always be in sync. When you get updates related to tiles outside the screen, the common idea is to store like a dirty region. You don't need to paint it right now. You just mark this area of the tile as dirty. If you get another dirty area for the same tile, you might just merge those two areas. Or if it's too big, you just might just discard the whole tiles and you paint it the whole tile next time. So this is not exactly enough to get to make sure that on the device can like at 60 frames per second for padding, painting, or rotation. Because we're having the repaints, we're having loading, it can happen load while padding, and there can be JavaScript executing. So the basic idea is that you just suspend all JavaScript, you're padding, you're pinching, you're rotating, people don't care if the comments are updated. You suspend JavaScript, you defer loads, if there's some load going on, do it later, and people have finished padding, and they go repaints. Because people don't care about these things, you don't notice it, but it just makes sure that we can really paint things in sex frame per second. This wasn't, wouldn't be possible, for instance, if you did a pinch zoom on a page. I don't know how long it would take to repaint that area. Because there might be more text, there might be more rectangles, it might take a bit longer. So when, when we do a pinch zoom, we do something more. We don't paint anything. So basically, we store the whole tiles. We keep the tiles what we had, and we just scale it, just like an image. <coughs> just to figure this whole tile is one big image. You just scale it up, you can do that 60 frames per second without problem. When you're finished, we repaint everything. So it looks nice, sharp text. It's really good. <coughs> Rotation is also a bit tricky. Normally you want to see the same thing. If I'm looking like a portrait, I'm reading the natural disk comes in front of the flowering. Flavoring, so I'm rotating, it should just scale up so I'm looking at the same area. So that's the basic thing. Look at the difference between the width and the height. And either multiply or divide that factor depending on how you're rotating it. The iPhone did a bit more. They can make it possible for web developers, web authors, to decide how content should be laid out. This is something that's particularly very important for web applications. For instance, if you look at the Google page, they're made meant as web apps. It says like the maximum scale is one. Don't do this scale up when I'm rotating. I don't want it. So it would mean if we look at normal Google here, rotate it. There's some area missing. So what we do, what all the others do, what Android, what iPhone, what everyone are doing, because everyone is implementing this today, even Opera and Firefox or mobile, is that we have to really up with the new view. We just said, okay, it doesn't fit. We really up the whole concept as it has a width that was larger. Basically like what you see there. But we don't want to do this really out while we're rotating, because then we can't ensure the 60 frames per second. So we have the above as a middle step. We rotate it, we keep the comfort that it has, just paint some checkerboards or something else in there, where there's no contents, and when you finish, you read it out. So you get a smooth animation, rotation animation, and then you get the contents that you want. So, something up. You freeze the backing store, you suspend the JavaScript, paint, etc. You keep the old contents, rotate, and then you move it out and unfreeze. So, let's go on to web apps. I'm, I'm not going into details why people should make web apps, when it makes sense, when it doesn't make sense. I haven't made another presentation about that. There's a link here for those people who are interested. I think our slides will probably get on the faster page later. 
so we'll be able to check that out. But let's just set a pivot so web apps make sense in those other situations. So, how do we go about supporting this? Well, the idea with web apps is that they should behave like real apps. What does that mean? Well, it means that one CSS pixel should be like a device pixel. You don't want it to be scaled. Normal, pace, not, normal apps don't have a scale. You don't want to have pins to, at least not the whole application, because normal app applications don't have that. And you want to be able to control like input, touch input yourself. So for instance, you could implement in your web app like pin, pin, pin zoom, etc. So we really so mobile browsers usually today support touch to that. Which makes it possible for the pages to to deal with the events in, in the way they say see fit. But that also means that every event we get, touch event we get you will have to send it to the web process. You will then have to handle it or ignore it. If it ignores it, you have to get back to us and then we can do our pinning or handling. But it means that we get this dependency then, or a slowdown, send it to the web process, wait for it to return, which is what we don't want. So there's some tricks that can be applied. Like you can check if the page actually registered a listener to the touch event. If it didn't, don't send any events to the web process, just deal with it on the UI side. <coughs> for controlling the layout, there has been a lot of different ideas for doing that, a lot of few different meta tags. But the latest one was introduced by the iPhone, it's called the viewport meta tag, and it's been quite popular. It's used on most of the mobile pages out there. Basically, the iPhone will lay out every contents as your web browser had the width of 980 pixels. On Android, the device manufacturer can, can decide when they want it to be 980, 1100, or some values like that. They have a few values to choose between. But for instance, if you even open up the Apple site with 980, it won't fit because they have this big image on the top that is larger. So they will need that page to be laid out with a, a larger view. So they added this meta tag to give this control to the web order to decide how to lay out contents, how to deal with scaling, etc. So the features is that you can you can define the layout width, you can even define the height, it's not very used, but it's possible. Then you can define the initial, the minimum and the maximum scale. So you can control whether you, how you can zoom in and zoom out. And it's even possible to just disable or enable user scaling. So here's a few examples. This is one example that shows how it could be done. This, I have to say that this is defined in portrait mode. For instance, the original iPhone had like 320 pixels and a DPI of 160. So this will be to make a page look pixel perfect on an iPhone. So you set the width to 320 and maybe maximum scale of 1. So it's, you can't scale in or do anything else. Today, as people have different <coughs> devices with different resolutions, etc., it's possible to define like device width. So if your device is 480, it will lay out as good 480 as the width. One of the big issues with web pages and web apps is that, for instance, if you have a button, a button, a scroll or whatever you have done, how it's shown to the user, the size you will have, like how it is big in comparison with your finger, that depends on the DPI of the device. So if I have a high DPI, it might be so small that I can't really interact with it, and that's not what you want for a mobile app, for a web app. So I said the iPhone has a DPI of 160. So when this problem starts to arise, especially with Android phones, coming out with DPI of 240, people start to figure out how should we solve this issue. So Google, they made a definition of something called a density in independent pixel, and that's defined as a pixel on a 160 DPI phone. That is because all, most, if not all, web apps today are designed with the iPhone in mind. And now that the Android and the other application does exactly the same, this is how it's going to work. 
So, if you look at French and Firefox in the in Nokia N900 on uh, other on Android devices, TPR 240 or beyond, they actually scale up the content. So, if you had a 320 on the page, you would actually scale it up by 1.5. Right, 240 divided by 160. This is not what you always want because, oh, I bought this really nice device and has beautiful screen, <coughs> nice DPI, why is everything scaled up? So Android added something called a target density DPI, where it's possible to override. By default, it's set to, I think it's called medium DPI, which is 160, but it's possible to set it, for instance, to device DPI. And then via CSS, figure out if it's scaled or not, so you can load a different CSS file with better resolution, with, with images, bottom images with better resolution. So, summing up, making a mobile browser with touch devices has a lot of different requirements than making a desktop browser. Our focus is on the touch interaction, on seeing your content and, and interacting with it, so when you touch the venue, we need this engine application separation and a lot of small tricks to make everything work perfectly. I've just shown a few of them today, but there's a lot more, a lot of ideas you can do to make this really work. And for doing web apps, the application will need some support of the web order to decide whether the browser should support scaling, maybe whether it should even show the Chrome, etc. So, I hope you have enjoyed the show, and I hope that you have some, some good questions. Okay. Yes. Not really. 
the way this can be done is, like I said, you we'll use a shared memory area, so you can implement it the way you want. This is just basically the ideas how to do it. The implementation can vary depending on your hardware. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, you mentioned in the that you uh, wanted to draw tiles uh, separate so that you can get this uh, basic in the model. Is it possible to predict uh, the implementations and then keep the most tiles that are as often necessary or is that too much to